Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. This happened when I was about 16 years old. My dad had just scolded me for coming home late. I went outside and sat by our pool to cry my heart out. When I looked at the swing, there was an old lady sitting there looking at me. Immediately, I knew she was an apparition because she was almost transparent. I couldn't move. I thought I was yelling for help, but nothing seemed to come out. I closed my eyes, and when I opened them, she was gone. I saw her again as I was on my way out with some friends. She was motioning for me not to go. I thought I was imagining this and went out just the same. We got into a head-on collision accident. I was sitting in the front seat without a seatbelt on, but I was the only one not hurt. What I felt was like arms that pinned me to the seat. The last time I saw her was right after I had taken a bath. I decided to say something to her. What do you want? I don't know who you are and you're scaring me. Get out. I do not want to see you again. After going to bed that night, I was woken by a crying sound. It seemed to come from a lady. I figured it was her, so I said, I'm sorry for getting angry earlier, but I was scared. From that time on, I never heard or saw her again, ever. When I first met my current partner, he told me some very strange tales about his life and about real magic. Some of the stories he told me were really strange. Things that moved, pictures falling off walls around him, that sort of thing. I thought it wonderful talk, but that was about it. A couple of weeks later, my ex, who wanted me back, bought me some flowers. They were pretty, and although I had no intention of going back to him, I put them in a vase and positioned the vase next to the roses my partner had bought me in another vase. I told my partner about this, who was several thousand miles away at the time on a trip. By the way, I didn't own a cat or any other animal, and I did not leave the windows open. The next morning, when I woke up, I discovered my ex's flowers vase had somehow fallen over. So I cleared the mess, wondering how that might happen, and filled the vase with fresh water and placed it again on the countertop. When I arrived home from work, I was amazed to once again find my ex's flowers spilled and the vase knocked over. By now, I was beginning to wonder how this could be happening. 
determined to discount the growing idea that my partner had somehow caused this to happen, I refilled the vase and propped it up in such a way as it could not possibly fall over. Of course, when I came home later that evening, I was shocked to find that somehow the vase had once again been knocked over and the flowers spilled. Throughout all of this time, my partner's roses were just fine. I gave up at that point and tossed my ex's flowers away. It seemed to me that if my partner wasn't consciously making this happen, then I should take it as a sign. I heard my faucet in my bathroom, not completely turned on, but a steady stream. I never use that bathroom. I use the big one attached to my bedroom. I woke up sweating this morning. The AC switch was actually cut off. As soon as I turned it on, it was working fine. Then my CD player started playing, but it was playing music from years ago, not the CD in the player. I went over to it, and although the singing was loud and clear, the actual CD inside the player was not spinning. I turned it off, turned around, walked to the kitchen, heard something in the living room, walked back in and my CD player was open. Again, I truly thought I was losing it. This activity starts and stops. Nothing had happened for a long time, but it started again a few weeks ago and went away, and now it's back. I wake up hearing things, footsteps. I get up and they step. I can feel a presence around me. I can hear a low sound all the time. I don't see anyone. It feels so cold in the rooms of my house, but this is off and on. When it gets cold, things start to happen. My TV and radio have come on for no reason. Sometimes this can happen several times in a single day. As I'm sitting here typing this, my paper shredder has clicked on. I had an electrician come out, and $92 later he said all is fine with the wiring. I don't believe in ghosts or the devil, and I'm not overly religious, but I truly believe something strange is going on in my house. This episode of Weird Darkness is brought to you by the audiobook As I Await the Hunt by Valerie Hockert, narrated by Darren Marlar. As George is sitting in his tree stand, he questions things and that his mind wonders with each movement he sees, he relates it to people and situations in his own life, his wife, his children, his marriage, his friends, his job, are all included in this reflection. Whatever happened to my life? George asks himself as he's sitting there. His life isn't where it should be. He isn't where he should be. And here he is, sitting in a tree stand waiting for that perfect deer. Here a sample of As I Await the Hunt on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Yesterday, I checked into a hotel in the Netherlands and was given a room. The room initially looked good. It was very large and furnished in a period style. I took off my coat and began to unpack. However, I heard a sound that was a cross between a tapping and a dripping sound. It seemed to emanate from a big closet standing in the corner of the room. I went to the closet and listened, but it was the sort of noise that you cannot seem to trace. I opened the closet and it stopped. Thinking perhaps it was from next door or the heating, I resumed unpacking. However, when I closed the closet, the noise started again. By now I was puzzled and I investigated that closet and the area it was in closely. I pushed it, rocked it, 
looked inside for a cause, an explanation. Each time I went to the closet, the sound stopped. I began to feel the hairs on my neck stand up, and I decided I couldn't stay in that room. I called reception and told them about the noise and that there was no way I could put up with it. They said they would send someone up. After five minutes of constant clicking or knocking sounds and an incredibly strange atmosphere, I was determined to fight my case that I couldn't stay there. The hotel lady knocked on the door. I told her about the noise and she walked straight over to that closet and barely five seconds later she said, yes, I couldn't sleep with that either, sir. You heard it then? I asked, surprised. Oh, yes, she said. She left, promising to find me another room. After waiting another five minutes in that room, I could no longer stand it and I packed and went back down to reception. Within five minutes, they informed me the hotel was full and they had transferred me to another hotel. I asked if the room was haunted and was told they did sometimes have an issue with the room. I was pleased to leave. My story centers around the residence of my first older cousin. The house my cousin currently lives in has a history that still lives in the house. Prior to moving, my cousin did not live too far from his present location and he was in the process of relocating when a view of a lake came to him in a dream back in 2000. The house is situated across from the water treatment plant and the second floor of the house that my cousin lived in has a balcony with a view of the lake. An older woman who owned the house and whom my cousin also looked out for lived on the first floor until her death. African Americans could not stay in hotels in certain cities at the time of the segregation in the U.S., so when the woman was alive, the standard would be to stay in homes of the affluent blacks that lived in Baltimore City, Maryland. My cousin remembers pictures his landlord had of famous actors, political activists, musicians and writers, etc., who stayed there at her house while on tour. My cousin would tell me of voices he would hear as he was viewing a video on TV even when the volume was turned off, the voices could still be heard discussing the movie that was on the screen. There would be times when my cousin would feel a touch and he would know it would be his landlady just saying hello. I am sensitive and would feel the energy just as soon as I would drive up to the house and would politely give it a greeting. There are also several other female spirits that live in the house as well who have taken to my cousin and are quite content with him there. I would always wonder about the blue lights whenever I would drive past and he said the spirits in the house like the blue lights. During my visit, I got a feeling and a vision of an era long past and in the sunroom, a chair in the corner that the landlady would sit in every day and look out at the lake and the word flowers came into mind. My cousin has made this room his study, so I told the landlady and the house that the next time I would bring flowers and the next time I was compelled to buy lilies and when I last checked from my cousin, the flowers lasted a long time and the women of the house really enjoyed them. When still just a girl, the lady recounting the story had visited her grandmother's neighbor's house together with her grandmother. At some point, she needed to go to the bathroom and on the way back, she noticed the huge ornate grandfather clock. Something like steam seemed to be emanating from the clock and as she watched innocently, this steam materialized into the outline of a man. The man was nice and spoke to her kindly and at the time, she wasn't afraid at all. 
On returning to the living room, she told her grandmother about the clock and the man and took the two astonished older ladies into the hall. Of course, there was nothing there but the clock. A few days later, her grandmother showed her some old photos of her and her neighbor. She pointed to a man in one of these photos and told her grandmother that this was the man she had spoken to. Her grandmother went pale as she told her that the man was her neighbor's father and he had been dead for a very long time indeed. Ever since beginning this web series, Weird Darkness, back in October, I've wondered if it would somehow come back to haunt me. Pun intended. Last night, I discovered I was not crazy for wondering this. I do not have a clock in my room, so I do not know at what time this took place, but I was awakened by a sudden pounding on my bedroom window, like a single knock on the pane of glass. I sometimes am startled awake by things like this, a sudden loud bang, but typically it is only that, and I usually chalk it up to waking from a dream and it only being my imagination that I heard something. This time, however, the loud awakening sound was only the beginning. A few seconds later, as I was intently listening to possibly hear more and get my bearings, I felt a body next to me with hands moving from my back, stroking my sides, making their way towards my stomach. At first, I thought it was my bride, but I soon realized I was alone in the bed, and it took everything in me to force myself to turn over in bed, open my eyes, and peer into the dark. Nothing. Perfectly quiet and still. I prayed for Jesus to remove any evil entities in my house, thanked him for my salvation, and turned back over to sleep, slightly out of breath and thinking, well, you had to expect something like this to happen eventually. If you like the show, please consider becoming a patron and receive exclusive weird content and merchandise, shout-outs on social media, be eligible for monthly giveaways, become a producer of the show, or even be an advertising sponsor. Get the details by clicking the Patreon button at WeirdDarkness.com. Do you have a dark tale to tell? We're looking for personal, paranormal, or strange experiences, original, dark, and weird stories of fiction links to your favorite creepy pastas you'd like to hear narrated, strange tales from wartime, or whatever else you'd like to send. We always credit the authors, or you can submit your story and ask to remain anonymous, which we will, of course, respect. Send us your story at WeirdDarkness.com. Crying Lady was written by Luisa Munoz. The X's flowers were submitted anonymously. Something Strange is Going On in My House was also submitted anonymously. I Couldn't Stay was written by Gary Vasey. A View of a Lake was written by Tammy. The Ghost in the Clock was written by G. Michael Vasey from his book Ghosts in the Machines. And Hand in the Dark was written by Darren Marlar. You can find links to these stories or the authors in this show's description. All stories used on My Haunted Life Tuesdays can be found at MyHauntedLife2.com. Hear a sample of the audiobook As I Await the Hunt by Valerie Hockert on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Music by Shadows Symphony. All content and orchestration in Weird Darkness is used by permission of the authors and composers. Copyright Marlar House Productions 2016. Rebroadcast or duplication without express written permission is strictly prohibited. Find more episodes at WeirdDarkness.com and find more scares at MyHauntedLife2.com. 
I'm your creator and host, Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 for political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. In May of 2000, my friends and I were out walking on an early evening. My friend Dave wanted to go to the cemetery just for fun. We wanted to get spooked, I guess, so we agreed. We went through all the graves and I found it creepy and felt as if someone was watching me from far away. So I looked behind me and I thought I saw someone hiding behind a tree. But I thought my mind was playing tricks on me, so I didn't say anything. My friends were gathered around a tombstone. They found it interesting because it had some markings on it. Me and my friend Rachel went on to wander around when all of a sudden we heard someone crying out in the woods. We decided to go out and see what was going on. We were halfway into the woods when my friend saw something behind a bush. She was scared to go see what it was, so I went first and as I was walking, I saw two green eyes looking right at me. I just started screaming and I grabbed my friend who was petrified and we ran all the way back to the car. My other friends were still out in the cemetery and we quickly called them over to the car. I said that something dangerous was out in the woods and they quickly ran to the car and we sped away. While we were in the car, me and Rachel explained to them what happened. All of a sudden, we halted. My friend who was driving saw the exact green eyes I saw in the forest right up by a tree we had passed. To this day, we still don't know what was out there. The very next day, we called the police and they didn't find anything. This incident happened to my daughter about 15 years ago, which would put her at the age of 13. Her father and she had been visiting friends for the day. They had left the friend's place at around 11 to head home. They were driving down a road that doesn't see much traffic at that time of night. My daughter and her father were talking about a trip they were going to take the next day. All of a sudden, up the road in the headlight, was a woman walking alongside of the road. 
This was early September when the evenings get very cool. She had on shorts and was carrying something. When the car was about 20 feet behind her, she stopped walking and turned around as if to see who or what was coming down the road. When the car got to about 10 to 12 feet from this woman, my daughter and her father were stunned to see that this lady had no face. She was holding a blanket and there was movement under the blanket as if a baby was kicking. She was facing the vehicle as they passed her. Needless to say, my daughter and her father just looked at each other without saying a word. My daughter said her father was as white as a sheet. They never mentioned this incident for a long time. My daughter has many times tried to talk to her father about it, but he will always change the subject. I can't remember how old I was when I saw something at the foot of my bed. I saw an apparition standing there. It was so dark that I can't tell you too much about it. It seemed to be dressed in a flowing robe of some kind. I lay there without saying anything and felt something touch my left foot. I lay paralyzed, unable to move. To this day, my left foot is larger than my right foot. While I am not ambidextrous, I shoot a rifle left-handed and am right-handed in everything I do. To this day, I still don't know what it was. We moved into our house on Halloween Day 2002. It's located in Down East Maine, about a mile and a half from the seashore. It was built in the 1880s, and at one time it was pretty famous for chicken canning. One of the sons of the former owners was killed in action in World War II. We have love letters he wrote his three-month bride before he was killed right before the end of the war, 1945. The older gentleman who lived in the house prior to the people we bought it from actually died in the house, and it was a few days before anyone found him. But it appears a young girl is haunting the place, and we don't know who she is or why. I have seen her, and my father has seen her. The property also seems to be haunted because you walk by the windows, and I don't know how many times we've seen someone out in the fields around the house, walking towards the old goat pens, only to double back to look and see no one. The person in the field is wearing a white shirt and black suspenders. Here's some of the weird things we've encountered. We were doing renovations, having the roof replaced and having a dormer put in the upstairs bathroom. One day, when the workers were not there, my father and I were the only people in the house. I was upstairs in my bedroom, and my dad was downstairs in the library, directly below my room. There was a staircase that runs down the wall outside my door. He was sitting in his chair opposite the door and saw a girl come down the stairs, turn away from him, and go into the dining room. He thought it was me, so he called out to me, but I was upstairs and hadn't moved. About 20 minutes later, it happened again. We got up and searched, but no one was around except us. The night I saw her, I was laying in bed looking out the window when I felt someone standing over me. I looked to the side without moving and saw her face hovering over my bed. It was oval-shaped and in sharp contrast all whites and blacks. All I could see was her face. She was looking down at me with no expression, and then she just suddenly wasn't there anymore. I wasn't afraid, I'm surprised to say, I just felt like she was looking in on me. On Christmas Eve one year, I walked into the dining room to find two dead earthworms on the dining room floor. I have no idea where they came from. Needless to say, in December in Maine, the ground outside is frozen. There was no dirt on them either, they were just laid out like a present. We have a full basement as well, so there is no way they came up out of the ground and through the floorboards. 
I called my folks in to see, and it was a curious moment, but we threw them away and went on with whatever. An hour later, I came back through and there were two more worms laid out in the exact same spot. We checked, and the other two were still in the trash. Nothing more after that, but it was still weird. While we're working away, my old sister, who lives next door, watches the property for us. There's a small figurine of Uncle Sam that came from a red rose tea box that sits on the kitchen windowsill. Several times, my sister has come over after no one has been there for weeks to find that figurine moved to the kitchen table, more than five feet away, or to the kitchen counter, which is even farther. My nieces were cleaning the house for us, knocking down cobwebs and generally keeping the dust down, but refused to do so after they heard someone crying upstairs in the empty house. General haunting also abounds. You will hear footsteps in parts of the house where people are not about you. You will hear and feel doors open and close. Change in the air pressure is readily apparent, only to check and find nothing moved. Drawers in a certain bureau containing board games will open regularly. You hear it opening and then go look, and they're opened, pulled all the way out. At night, there's always a feeling of being followed around the downstairs of the house, but never on the second floor. And there are certain rooms in the house that always feel occupied, or that someone is outside staring through the curtains at you, even if the window is closed and the curtains pulled shut. I'm sure there is more, but this is all I can recall at the moment. We were contacted by the Dead Files TV show about possibly investigating our house, but the producers decided no one was scared to live there, so it wasn't exciting enough for TV. I almost completely forgot about the Victorian gentleman I saw. It was late at night, around 1 a.m. My sister and I were cleaning the house from top to bottom in preparation of my parents coming home for the holidays. I think it was Thanksgiving. My dad works nuclear outages, so they are away a lot. Anyhow, I was standing in the kitchen facing my sister who was in the dining room doorway. We were chatting about what had been done versus what needed to be done when behind her I saw the upper shoulder and lapel of a man's suit walk into the jelly cupboard, a converted door that once led to the basement. I can't imagine the look of shock on my face because my sister immediately asked what was behind her. I told her and we checked, but of course, there was no one there. And there wouldn't be. It's a solid wood door that leads to a six-inch deep pantry. He was all gray and tall. All I could see was the shoulder of a suit jacket and a lapel, but the cut reminded me very much of a frock coat. This episode of Weird Darkness is brought to you by the audiobook Singer of Lies, a science fantasy novel by Michael R. Collings, narrated by Darren Marlar. He is young and intelligent and highly trained. He is Eric Banfeld, shipwrecked on a long-forgotten colony world where brawn and brute strength are more valued than knowledge physically untrainable and emotionally unprepared in the barest skills of survival, he seems compelled to spend a short and very unpleasant life as a half-naked savage, worked like a beast of burden on a world so sunk into barbarism that its inhabitants have no concept of the wheel. It's either that or die. His only possible chance, his only hope of becoming one with the folk to become a storyteller, or as they call them, a singer. And not just any singer, but a singer of lies. Singer of Lies, a science fantasy novel by Michael R. Collings. Hear a sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. were touring the west coast of Scotland for a day or two. We had set out from Glasgow that morning and fully intended to go back there that night, 
but the day had been fun with lots to see and do, and so by the time we entered Inverary, it was already quite late. In fact, we had already visited Inverary Jail that morning before motoring a bit further up the coastline, so the idea of staying the night there seemed a good one and would give us more time to look around. In the end, we settled on the George in the main street and booked two rooms. My ex-wife and twin boys were allocated one room, while my elder son and I would take the other. The twins were very taken with their room and excitedly showed me the oak paneling, portraits on the walls, four-poster bed complete with heavy curtains, and the quaint but airy bathroom and suite that had an old-fashioned bath on four legs. They thought it a great and funny room. I didn't like it. Not at all. I was relieved to be sleeping down the hall in the more modern part of the hotel. Our room was normal, with two side-by-side single beds separated by a small table and lamp. By this time in my life, I had things more or less under control. It had been a long time since anything really strange had occurred, and at times I rather missed that. This night, however, especially in this room, I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up and a shiver went down my spine. I put it down to a draft, at least initially. We ordered dinner in the bar and enjoyed a couple of beers too. We couldn't really make it late because the twins were still fairly small and tired early in the evening. Reluctantly, it was soon time to go to bed and off we all went up the staircase accordingly. Given my earlier discomfort and sixth sense that not all was quite normal with the hotel, I was uncomfortable. I slept like a log. Really, I did. Nothing happened at all. I was relieved. At breakfast, I remarked that my ex-wife looked like she had had a bad night. She glared at me over tea and toast and said, You have no idea. The twins nodded in unison. What happened? I asked. Dad, there was an old man, a nasty old man in our room, said one of the twins. Really? I asked. Apparently, they had gotten into the four-poster bed and switched on the TV. After a short while, they switched out the lights and although all was okay until after they slept, my ex-wife said that she felt like someone was watching her. Later, they were woken by the bedclothes being pulled from the bed, and one of the twins swore that there was an old man in the room that didn't want them there. Noises and unexplained bangs occurred throughout the night, and eventually our son pointed at a portrait that was dimly visible on the wall and said, It's that man, mummy. They removed the portrait, turned it to face the wall. They tried the best they could to sleep with the lights on. It wasn't much of a night's sleep for any of them, by all accounts. There was an old man odor in the room, too, I was told. For once, it wasn't me that experienced bizarre things. Nonetheless, I had known there was something about that room, and I had said nothing. Not that it would have made any difference, I suppose. The absolute weirdest experience ever was when I was dating a girl while in grad school who admitted that she was kind of seeing someone else at the time, but he lived on the other side of the state. She told me that he and his previous girlfriend had been in a car accident the year before, yada, yada, yada. One night, I looked out my window and there was something sitting on the balcony of my apartment, looking in at us. It was a woman banged up and beaten up with a huge gash in her neck. She just sat there, staring, and eventually disappeared while I blinked. The next morning, I asked the girl if she knew what the other guy's girlfriend had looked like, then described the thing that I'd seen the night before. She said that was exactly what she'd looked like, and that she'd bled to death in the accident from a neck wound. I broke up with her very shortly afterward. I didn't want another visit from whatever that was. (laughs) 
While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. There is a knock at the door late at night. You answer it to find two small children standing there. You're suddenly filled with an inexplicable fear. Let us in, they say. We need to use the phone. It's at that point the fear turns to utter dread as you see that these kids have completely black eyes. The Black Eyed Kids is an exploration of this terrifying phenomenon using true stories of encounters with black eyed kids submitted to the My Haunted Life 2 website. G. Michael Vasey examines the evidence and investigates the terrifying black eyed kids phenomenon, coming to some startling and shocking conclusions. Are they demonic soul eaters responsible for the disappearance of some of the 90,000 Americans missing at any point in time? Or is this just another urban legend? another boogeyman designed to keep you awake at night. Listen to the book and find out. The Black Eyed Kids by G. Michael Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. paintings sometimes feature strongly in paranormal activity. I will give two examples to prove my point. The first is a story that my father told me a couple of times about his childhood. His mother was a bona fide medium, and he grew up with strange goings-on just as I did. In fact, this is why he was sympathetic to my dilemma. Apparently, he and his family had once temporarily lived in a flat on the top floor of a three-story building. On the day that they were moving out, he recalled watching the comings and goings of people moving furniture and belongings. Eventually, all was complete, and he and his mother stood outside of their front door as she locked the apartment one last time. But mom, what about this picture here? said my dad to his mother, pointing to the picture propped up against the wall at the top of the staircase. His mother looked puzzled for a moment and then asked my dad who it was that he saw in that empty picture frame. My dad had always seen a little old man in the picture with eyes that followed him, and he was more than a little shocked to learn that there had never been any picture in that empty frame. The second instance involved a week we spent in the family house of a friend in mid-Wales. He had inherited an estate, complete with a sizable house by the coast. The house was 16th century, and on arrival, I knew it was haunted. There was no two ways about it. I could feel it, and it was with some trepidation that I knew we would spend a week here with friends and my parents. The front entrance was into a large, gloomy, and poorly lit hall. The darkness wasn't made any better by the dark wood paneling covering the walls. Frankly, it was creepy. Things began to happen almost immediately. My parents complained about a sort of darkness in their room that pulled their bedclothes off. They swapped to another bedroom. Apparently, that one wasn't much better either as the door kept opening by itself. Once again, nothing happened to me, though. I was in self-protect mode from the moment we arrived. However, the creepiest incident yet again involved a portrait. Hanging halfway down the stairs in that creepy, oak-paneled hall was the portrait of a man. To be honest, I barely noticed it, but our eldest son told us that when he had gone past it, its eyes followed him, and so he had stopped to look at it to see if he really was being watched by the painting. 
At this point, the head of the man in the portrait actually came out of the picture and spoke to him. Of course, he completely freaked out at this, as you might expect. Whether this was just a young and fertile imagination, we will never know, but to him, it was a real and terrifying experience. The entire week was punctuated with strange incidents, and on the last evening, we had a dinner party outside with the housekeepers who lived nearby on the estate. The conversation naturally turned to the experiences we had had, and they listened, nodding their heads. They had heard all of the stories before from other guests and experienced some themselves, too. The bedroom with the darkness, the portrait in the hall. I was at the crematorium just after my boyfriend Robert died. I was putting flowers on his plot. As you can imagine, I was very upset. I just missed him so much. I also think that sometimes our emotions can play tricks on us, so I'm not sure if I had imagined it or if this really happened. I was there kneeling by the plot, crying and talking to him, telling him how much I missed him. All of a sudden, I looked round, and there behind me was an old man. I still do not know where he appeared from, as it was early morning and the crematorium was completely empty when I arrived. The old man smiled at me and said, Do not worry and be upset. He's okay, and you will in time learn to deal with the loss of your loved one. He knows you loved him very much. It will get easier. I looked at him, smiled, and said thank you. I looked back at the plot and then behind me to look at the old man, and he was gone. At the time, I was too upset to think anything of it and thought he must have gone through the entrance. But when I left, I began to wonder where the old man had gone, as the entrance was quite a walk from where I was and he would have still been in sight when I looked up. I wonder if I had been crying for longer and didn't see him walk out the gate. But still, today, I think about it. Can a ghost come to us and look human? Maybe he was a spirit helping me come to terms with my grief. Or was I such an emotional wreck that I did not even notice him? When I was about six or seven years old, our home phone rang. It was about 9 p.m. at night. My mom was busy in the other room, so she asked me to answer it. When I did, at first, I heard lots of static. I repeated over and over again, hello, hello, but nobody answered, just all this static. Thinking that must have been a wrong number, I started to hang up, but then a voice caught me, hello, said the voice. To my surprise, it sounded like my grandfather. I said, Grandpa? Grandpa, I can't hear you. And he said something like, Hi, baby, how are you? Can I speak with your mommy? So, thinking it was my mother's father, who is still with us, I gave my mom the phone and left the room. However, when she came out of the room, she had this weird look on her face. I asked her what was wrong, and she said, that was your grandfather. I told her that. Well, of course I knew my grandfather's voice, but she said, no, that was not my father, it was your dad's father. I could not believe it, even as a seven-year-old, that it was my father's father, who had died many, many years before when my dad was just a boy. My mom said that he had called to see how we were doing and that he had finally got a chance to hear his first granddaughter's voice. I was glad that I did answer the phone, because if my mom had answered, I probably would not have had a chance to talk with him. My mom said that, after a few words, his voice just faded away into the static. Too bad there wasn't such a thing as caller ID back then. I have never had another paranormal experience. One was enough.
My father used to tell me a story about an experience he had in the late 1950s while on a sales trip through the hills of rural Pennsylvania. My grandfather was traveling on a dirt road when he saw a rough-looking man walking by the side of the road far off into the distance. He always said that his dirty, faded blue clothes looked torn and he was stumbling, like he had either had too much to drink or had been in a fight. The closer he got to the man, the worse he began to feel for him and thought he would at least offer him a lift to the next town. As he got closer, he saw that this man was all cut up and burned and wearing a blue uniform with a blue fedora with a yellow band. Then he noticed that the man was wearing a Civil War military uniform. My father went to pull over, passing him further up the road. He then sat there and waited for this person to come walking up to the car. Then he looked behind him and could see the man stumbling up behind the car. So my father opened the door for him and then sat and waited. But no one came to the door as he sat there. He looked behind him in the back window and the man had disappeared. My father got out of his car and looked around, thinking the man may have tripped or fallen into the gutter. To his dismay, he could not find the man. My father just assumed, for whatever reason, the man went off into the woods or something. Deciding to continue his journey, he got back into the car, shut both doors, and returned on his way. About three miles ahead, there was a sign that read, Gettysburg Battlefield. My father said when he saw that, it really creeped him out. This episode of Weird Darkness is brought to you by the audiobook Winter Wonderland, a Dallas Powell mystery by T. Lee Harris, narrated by Darren Marlar. Winter has Louisville in its grip, and former FBI agent Dallas Powell has his hands full with car trouble, cat trouble, and trying to keep the Derby City branch of True Blood Investigations and Security Incorporated solvent. When a juicy insurance job comes his way, he jumps at it, but the discovery of a decades-old murder spawns a veritable blizzard of violence, and Dallas finds himself right in its path. Winter Wonderland, a Dallas Powell mystery. Available now on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. After my dad had died, a few strange things began to happen in our house. The strangest incident happened one day when my daughter had gone out for the day. My husband and I had been talking in the front room when our daughter came home and shouted hello to us. We thought nothing of it, called back hello, and continued our conversation. About an hour later, the phone rang. My husband answered it and shouted upstairs for our daughter Jane. When Jane failed to answer, he went upstairs thinking she must have been busy asleep or preoccupied. She wasn't at home. My husband told her friend that she wasn't home and we shrugged the whole thing off as nothing. About 15 minutes later, Jane came home and we asked her why she had gone out so suddenly. She just looked at us like we were pulling a prank. She claimed that she hadn't been home. So who was it? We still wonder who was mimicking her to this day. About 17 years ago, I was living in Montana in a house that was pretty far outside of the city limits. Right from the start, the house did strange things. The lights would cut out, as would the TV, and then the TV started changing channels on its own. Items would move from place to place on their own. One night, I went outside to feed my dog. I noticed my dog was staring at the back door of the house and making noise. 
I thought that was strange, so I looked around and saw a woman dressed in very old clothing, likely from the Wild West era, standing by the door. When she saw me looking at her, she closed the door and disappeared into thin air. I was pretty shaken up by it and ran over to the door. It was locked. I ran around to the front of the house and found my two sons and my wife sitting in the TV room watching TV. I honestly thought they were pulling a prank on me. They denied it, so I just tried to forget about it and went back outside to feed the dog. I kept the door open and placed a brick there to keep it open. I went over to the dog and got back to my chore of feeding the dog. He started whining again, so I looked back around and there was that lady again. This time the door closed onto the brick and she disappeared. I was beside myself. I ran back around and accused my family of playing pranks on me. They assured me they wouldn't do such a thing and slowly I started to believe them. After doing some research, I found out that a lady lived in that house alone and that she was murdered one night. She had been buried somewhere on the property. We still have happenings every now and again, and she still creeps me out, but I hope she is resting in peace. At home, we have a main floor family room, which looks up to a deck that looks down into the family room. We were getting ready for supper. My son was upstairs in his bedroom reading with his aunt. My wife, mother, daughter, and myself were in the kitchen below. The kitchen is an open concept to the family room, so you can see pretty well everything in the family room. I was standing on the edge of both rooms. All of a sudden, I heard a noise coming from the deck. I went to investigate and saw that a large framed picture of a tiger on the wall above the deck was the source of the noise. I actually saw the picture moving. Then something picked it up and hurled that picture, which is quite heavy, into the family room. It made a loud thud when it hit the floor and everybody came running to see what had caused all that noise. Nobody believed me when I told them what I saw. I think it's important to mention that my father passed away suddenly a few years ago. I put this picture temporarily on the wall again and tried holding it there, but it still moved several millimeters. That picture flying off the wall was the creepiest thing I have ever witnessed. Even though after my father's death we have heard many strange noises in our home. The strangest thing that happened to me was when I was growing up in Tennessee. My mother was ill and out of work, and we lived in a very old house near Knoxville. We all slept in the same bedroom, my mother, my younger sister, and I. This arrangement was done in order to close off the other rooms for better heating. My story takes place late one night. We had gone to bed early, and I had been sleeping soundly until I suddenly woke up for no reason and had a feeling that someone was watching me. I turned over to look toward my mother, who was asleep in the bed with my younger sister. I then noticed something that really terrified me. Sitting in an old chair, between the two beds was an elderly-looking gentleman. He looked real with graying hair and was wearing a white, long sleeve shirt with dark slacks. He was just sitting there, staring right at me. I forced myself to turn away and tried to find a reason for what I had just seen. I couldn't find one and couldn't find enough courage to turn over and look again. I just closed my eyes and tried to go back to sleep. I didn't tell anyone about this sighting. A few years later, I was at a family gathering for a meal. After our meal, we were making small talk when my younger sister brought up our childhood and the earlier years at that old house. To my surprise, she mentioned that the only thing that really bothered her was the old man who she had seen in our bedroom 
where our mother slept with us. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>